I am just click got it. I am really excited to be talking today about behaviors communication. And I'm, I really like this presentation because it's very strategy heavy. And then also we're going to end with some case studies. So I hope that maybe we can have some really like practical hands-on information that may be um, useful to like your current practice or your current centers or families or your own family. So I'm going to share the slides here. So here we go. I'm so new to Canva. This is, I had never known Canva. And then I, I work with um, a bunch of awesome therapists who are younger than me and more technologically savvy. And they introduced me to Canva. So I've been learning all about it. Uh, so this is our presentation today, a behavior as communication. So here's the poster. I'm gonna go to the next one. So before I dive into the agenda, I just wanted to maybe introduce myself a little bit and let you know a little bit about my practice and where I've come from. So I'm a, my name is Holly, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a speech language pathologist. I've been practicing for almost 13 years now and primarily working in pediatrics, both like early, early intervention and school age services. But I have had the, lots of opportunities to work with like a breadth of clients throughout my career and done some work with adults in the hospital setting as well. Uh, I'm very, very passionate about client affirming services and helping my clients reach their goals that are important to them and helping them live as authentically as themselves. And I think a lot of our practice has really changed, particularly from when I was in grad school and kind of what I had learned now. So it's been a lot of unlearning for me and changing kind of throughout the years as like our practice has shift, has shifted into kind of working collaboratively with our clients on goal setting and addressing things that are important to them as opposed to kind of maybe going off things that we had thought before from textbooks or norms or things that maybe our clients should be working on so today we're going to be talking about behaviors communication so we're going to be going through some definitions about kind of what all those words mean we're then going to kind of go through talking about some potential triggers. Uh, then we're going to be talking about some kind of special considerations and some strategies. And then we're going to be going into some case studies. So as Christine said, like, I love questions and dialogue, like it is never a bother to me if you have any question or any thought or if any of this is ringing true, or if you're thinking about a particular client or, you know, that you're working with, and you kind of want to spitball about that, like, I'm happy to hear any um, thoughts or comments. So communication, so this is kind of our first definition. So communication is the sharing of information. And I think what's important here is that communication is not just verbal communication, particularly when it comes to behavior, because we as speech pathologists really view behavior as a form of communication. So, and behaviors, when we say that, we're thinking of different things like facial expression, gestures, body language, push-pull behaviors, um, lots of different ways that our clients and kids are communicating to us through their behavior that I think we really, really want to be tuned into. So that's kind of what I mean is communication. It's just that overarching sharing of a message. And communication can be done one-on-one, -on -one, so between two individuals. It can also be done like as a larger group. So as because I'm communicating to our group this morning, or even like a larger scale, so like a billboard, for example, is like communicating a message to the masses. So communication, again, is just that sharing of information and not just verbal. So what do we mean by behavior? So I kind of wanted to talk about this and include this because behavior is a bit of a word that has that negative connotation. So we kind of hear that and we think of like a child's behavior and immediately we're thinking of um, a negative behavior. So what we mean by behavior, it's encompassing any action. So any kind of action or thing that we're doing is a behavior. But people often use it in kind of describing those like unpleasant or like non preferred actions of like students or children. Um, again, it has a negative connotation. And we're really striving to kind of neutralize this term. And we really want to emphasize the importance of like validating and honoring all communication, including behavior. Because when a behavior is happening, we really want to approach it with curiosity and not judgment. That's kind of, if there could be like one big takeaway today, I would say that is that looking at a behavior with like a curious lens and thinking what need is not being met or what is this child or person trying to communicate with me as opposed to coming from it from a place of judgment or thinking kind of in that negative space. And it can be hard because 
oftentimes our own experiences and you know our own upbringing or our own traumas can often influence how we see behavior. So it's really important as like a provider or a support like in that moment to this child or this family or in this classroom that you're coming from a neutral place and trying to, again, evaluate that with curiosity and from a place of like investigation and seeing what this child or person is trying to communicate. And again, behavior in most cases is a sign that like a student or a child, they may not have the skills or awareness to express their needs. And that's why you might be wondering like why speech pathologists, because often like behavior, you might think like, oh, we might need like a behavioralist or a behavior consultant or like a psychologist that could support this. But we kind of think it falls within our scope of practice because it's a form of expression. And often when we see children, if they don't have those words or a more appropriate way to communicate that. And I'm appropriate, I mean, they're, I don't mean that kind of in that way that you know behavior is bad and that verbal communication is good. Cause I think often too, sometimes verbal communication is really placed on a pedestal. And so that's when you may see things like use your words or like, you know, I know you can tell me that, but they are telling you, right? If you're receiving the message, we wanna honor that communication and acknowledge that. So, so that's kind of how we think of as behavior kind of fits in within our scope as SLPs. So some examples of behavior. So, and these are all things I've experienced. This is all from like personal experience. So it can be things like pushing to the front of the line hitting or biting, using inappropriate language at school. Um, so those are kind of some of our more like outward behaviors that we think of when we think of a behavior kind of, and you might even sometimes hear terms like an aggressive behavior in terms of like hitting or like throwing things, things like that. Um, but there's also behaviors that we wouldn't think of as perhaps in that kind of domain, like crying easily or infrequently, um, holding like hands up to face or ears, ramming or crashing into others like even unintentionally um putting like their head down on their desk I often affectionately call it like noodling like when we have some of those kind of passive some behaviors where learners might be trying to kind of like avoid so it's like a bit of noodling head down um we might see things as well like kind of using a very loud voice volume um or being very kind of like silly or erratic or kind of really all over the place we know that their engine is running a bit high I thought I would just pose a question out here just to hear from your experience. Are there any other behaviors that you maybe are seeing or have experienced with like your, you know, families or classrooms or centers or? And if, if you're not comfortable sharing in the chat is also totally fine. I would say children don't respond to your requests, like totally ignoring. Yes. what you're saying to them absolutely and i hear that like a lot as a speech pathologist when talking about goals you know mom or dad or family will say oh you know they're they're not kind of like following or listening to my instructions i know they understand but they're kind of just not responding or not kind of following through with that so yeah like not responding to directions or requests or questions or input right again that might be again one of those more passive type behaviors so I just see the chat, oh, like rocking their body or fishing like their legs. Absolutely. A lot of behaviors. So I'm kind of like spoiler alert. I'm going to get into this a bit more, but there's generally four root causes of behavior. And a big one is often associated with like changing the level of stimulation. So if a child needs like is overstimulated, that can result in behaviors or if a child is under um, stimulated. So sorry, Valerie corrected there to fisting their legs. So maybe putting some deep pressure, are you meaning Valerie, like on their legs, like kind of like pounding? That's maybe what I would think about that. But again, still makes me think of perhaps like they're kind of aiming to change that level of stimulation. So either trying to maybe rev themselves up or if they're, over, yeah, like pounding. So yeah, that is something I've seen as well before. So children are very smart. And often it's very intuitive, like, how can I get this need met? And another kind of saying or something that I will hear a lot, like with other professionals is children will use a certain behavior because on some level it works for them, right? Like, so if, if it's working and it's meeting that need or it's helping fill that gap, even if it's not maybe the most functional in the long term, because in that short term, in that moment, it might be a very functional kind of thing, right? So for a child that kind of meets that need, 
And why, why would I change or why wouldn't I do that if it's meeting that need? So that's often kind of where we can come in and try and support that child with perhaps like another strategy or another way we can meet that need that is perhaps more functional in the long term. So if we like zoom out how we can kind of meet this need. Thanks so much for sharing, Valerie and Christine. So again, so I probably sound like a little bit of a broken record, but again, this is one of those key things. So two important notes about behavior that I think are so important. Behavior comes from unmet needs. So we often see like those quote unquote behaviors, they're reduced or completely eliminated when we give our student or child the necessary skills and they're also afforded the necessary accommodations. So if we are meeting that need or setting them up for success, whether that's in the preschool environment, in their home environment, in the classroom, we often can see that those behaviors can be significantly reduced or eliminated. The second piece of the puzzle that I think is so important is there's no like roadmap to these behaviors. There's no one size fits all strategy or there's no um, easy answer. Like every child or client is completely individual. And we really need to look holistically at that child and client and develop strategies from there, from our personal knowledge and connection with that client versus kind of like our roadmap or any formula that we think like, oh, they're doing this. So then this is what we need to do. Sometimes that, hey, that may work, but sometimes it may not. So we really need to learn and connect with our clients, children, families first. That connection is so, so, so important because that helps us learn about where they're at, what they've tried, what their individual needs are. How is this going to fit into this classroom or with this family? And also helps us learn more about their methods of communicating non-verbally. Like from our education, our background, our experiences, we might have like a pretty good guess. Like I was kind of postulating with that learner that or Valerie was sharing about that it may be like a changing of stimulation or a sensory need, but I don't know that. Um, I would really have to kind of further establish that connection and meet that child, do some observation, connect with them, talk with their family, view the classroom and do kind of some of that background before we could kind of develop a really great strategy or um, help equip that classroom with accommodations and that child with skills. So those are kind of like also two very important notes. So here's kind of this little bit about triggers. So we know there are all these behaviors and every child is individual or every client is individual, but there are some things that we know that may set off behaviors. And these are kind of like a great starting place. So if you feel like you're a bit lost or this may be new to you, or um, maybe a child is kind of presenting a little bit differently than what you're familiar with. These are kind of things I like to think of as maybe like, could this be it? So a, a big first one is like a task being above their ability level. So, you know, kids often don't have maybe some of that kind of like up above thinking to kind of view it and think like, you know, I'm struggling with this, this activity, this task, and this is hard for me. And I, I could ask for some help and that might ease my frustration. A lot of different skills kind of go into that. that that's kind of a higher level skill, right? And like self-awareness and then knowing that problem solving of like what I can do to help you with that. So often, particularly young children, what they, that may result in is behaviors. So we really want to ensure that when we're, you know, assigning tasks or helping a child with anything, either in like a preschool setting, a home environment or school, we want to ensure that the task is matching um, their ability level, or again, those scaffolding or accommodations are in place. So we know that they will be successful. So like a big one, for example, is like dressing, like I'm sure in every preschool or daycare environment, like kind of getting ready to go outside, it become quickly can become like a very like elevated, like wah kind of environment. And we know if there's some kids who are struggling, like to get their boots on, get their coat on, and they may be lagging, pushing friends, being silly, off task, disruptive. And so we might want to think like, hey, like maybe this is difficult for them. So what could we put in place for this learner? Maybe we could ensure that there is someone there to support them during this time. Maybe they could have a little checklist of what they need to put on. Maybe we could modify the task with them, just like putting their coat on and then we'll come help zipper. Or maybe we know that like snow pants are really big or difficult for this kiddo. So we're going to ensure that maybe they have a buddy that can help them with their snow pants. So try and put in some of these strategies and accommodations because we know that the, like a behavior may result from that. 
another kind of big piece about my behavior, sorry, as I talk, I'm like, I digress, but <laughs> is being proactive. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit as well. With any behavior, we want to be ahead of it as a, it's in a much better place to help support that child or client than being in a place where we're having to be reactive. So once kind of the behavior is already happening, that child may already feel elevated. And then that is not generally a really good teachable moment. So it's like, they're kind of already at like the top of that wave cresting and they're up here. And no matter what, like great language we use, what we may offer to help them, that may not get through. Like that child may feel very frustrated. And again, that's not that good teachable moment. However, we can be ahead of it if we can kind of see the wave coming and be proactive and put some things in place ahead of time. That's often where we can help that child feel supported and we can maybe reduce some of these um, you know, non-functional behaviors. So getting ahead of things is really where we wanna be. And what comes from that is the detective work and knowing that child and knowing their triggers and that they're coming. Because we, we don't often start there, you know, that takes a little bit of time to like see kind of the waves coming. But once we do, we wanna try and put things in place ahead of that. Um, so just getting back to our triggers. So similar to the task being above their level, a child maybe not having the words to describe their feelings. So if this is a child with like a speech or language delay, um, if this is a younger child, uh, like they may not have the words. And so often they're describing that feeling through behavior. So they're showing us kind of how they're feeling as opposed to speaking it. And again, we want to acknowledge that and honor that. I think one of the most important things that we can do in that moment, once maybe that wave is crested, because again, when you're at the top of the peak, if a child is, you know, uh, in an outburst, all these great things are not going to matter. But when they're calmer, we can help provide some of that language and really validate that feeling. So, you know, I wonder if you were feeling really mad about X, Y, Z, turning your show off or um, having to leave this fun activity or whatever it may be. So you were feeling so mad. I feel mad sometimes too. These are some things that I try and do when I feel mad. And maybe I can coach you with that or co-regulate with you and help you with that. So trying to give them maybe some of those words and those calmer kind of moments and help them with that. Uh, as I said before, like going on to number three down here is being like overstimulated. So when there's a lot of noise, lights, bodies, their own body, that level of stimulation can really set up a behavior. How we wanna approach that is again, being ahead of it, being aware of maybe what is overstimulating this child and seeing how, what kind of accommodations that we could provide. So perhaps we know that at like an assembly, for example, like getting into the assembly is a very, very busy time. Maybe that child would really benefit from some earmuffs or maybe that child could be last to come in. So they're spending less time in this big group environment. Maybe we could do a little like pre-teaching about what's happening at the assembly so that they're kind of aware that it might be noisy, that they might then need to sit like in close proximity to friends or help again, getting ahead of it before being proactive versus reactive. Um, another trigger is maybe like intense anxiety, like that anticipation anxiety about an activity or an interaction. So if something's coming up ahead of the schedule and we know that a child may feel nervous about that, unsure about that, maybe it's new or unpredictable, or sometimes even something like super exciting. Like maybe we know later today, like we're going to go to like, you know, a, a big field trip to the zoo or something really exciting, which we think is like a really kind of fun thing. But just even the waiting for that and the anticipation can cause like a lot of anxiety for kids. And we may see like a lot of behaviors happening as a result of that. Uh, so, and again, we want to get ahead of that, right? So we could do that with visual schedules, doing some pre-teaching. Oh, sorry. I just see the chat here. Did I miss something? Oh, Christine was saying, yeah, if the room has too many posters on the walls, absolutely. Visual stimulation is huge. It's often um, overlooked. So thanks, Christine, for bringing that up. I think people really kind of think of like noise and um, like bodies. And certainly those are, tr you know, triggers as well. But visual stimulation, right? That can be really bothersome for some kids, right? So we may want to position their desk if it's in a classroom in a certain way. We may want to like eliminate some of like the posters and stuff going on on the walls. So those are ways we can accommodate, right? And try and get ahead of that behavior. Um, similar thinking back to triggers are like when things are unpredictable. So similar to that anticipation, but when things are going to change or we can't 
you know, and there are things that we can't predict, of course, but there are ways that we can kind of help pre-teach some of those skills to help children have some more tools in their toolbox for dealing with things when they are unpredictable. And we know like sitting for long periods of time, that can be like a big trigger. So for some children, that's like a really, really hard thing. If they've been sitting for a long, long time and we know that their engine rubs by movement or that helps them regulate, if we know we haven't been able to do that kind of moving regulating activity for a long time, we know that we may anticipate that there might be some behavior, whether transitioning from that sitting or if we're trying to extend that sitting or move to like another seated activity, we would be better to try and meet that need before transitioning kind of into another activity. So some other triggers here on the right are like being forced to stim or not fidget. So we kind of at our practice really kind of focus on autism affirming services and we really kind of promote like stimming positivity and trying to view it in a different light because stimming is often a very, very important tool for autistic people or other neurodivergent people. And repressing that need can often be very dysregulating to them and help that like ultimately then result in either one of these kind of maladaptive or non-functional behaviors. So we really wanna promote that stimming positivity, but again, we want it to be something that is not disruptive or functional over the long-term because there are some stims that we know um, are, we're not able to do in like a classroom environment or in a preschool environment because oh, it may be Holly? bothersome. Yes. What, what is a STEM? Oh, so kind of like, you know, it can be lots of different things. Thanks so much for asking. So stimming can be things like uh, traditionally we kind of think of like flapping hands. So it's kind of like a repeated body movement that, oh, okay. yeah, like, a uh, you know, an autistic person or child may be doing to self-regulate. And we as like, you know, as neurotypical people, they often will also have stims. Like, you know, you might see like shaking your leg or tapping a pencil or like twirling your hair. Something that we kind of do either consciously or subconsciously to kind of help us regulate or focus. Um, and it is something that we kind of often see in a lot of profiles of autistic people. And it can look like a wide variety of things. It can be things also like vocal stimming. So like yelling or screeching. Um, it can be things like you know, with like toys like poppets or fidgets or things like that, like a child could use to stim. So, so does okay, that kind of answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So oftentimes, like I said, some of those things can be distracting, right? So like screeching, for example, you're in like a classroom or a preschool environment. Um, it can be quite disruptive to the rest of the class. So we want to then, as the professionals, that's where we would want to kind of trum it, kind of come in and see if there's a way that we can meet that need with a more functional in the long-term strategy. So if it's like, vocal stimming so if you think with screeching perhaps like what they're getting out of it is like hearing the noise so an auditory stim maybe that learner could benefit from like some headphones and like having some time like at set intervals or in the classroom or maybe before like a tough sit down activity where they could like have like some white noise or loud noise or something playing in their earphones that might kind of help meet that like auditory need that they're feeling before they want to kind of go in. Or, I mean, maybe they could be listening to it while they're at their desk working, right? If it's not disrupting others, maybe have some headphones on and have like some different white noises or other noise, screeching noises, whatever they would find um, regulating in that way. So again, the common thread is of course, just trying to get ahead of it. So doing what we can, putting things in place for that learner to have the tools to meet their needs and our classrooms or preschools or homes set up to accommodate. But again, we don't want to suppress that STEM and that's kind of an, an old kind of viewpoint of working with like autistic people or you know neurodivergent people is that we often are looking from our neurotypical lens and we oftentimes goals were kind of like, well, no, like we don't do that because we want this child or person to mask and to fit in like, cause this is how we do it in our neurotypical way. Like it's not appropriate to be you know, stimming or wearing headphones or doing anything that you need. But now we want to be affirming that that's meeting that need for that person. And that we, we need to, you know, celebrate diversity and how, you know, people's brains work differently. And then trying to, you know, fit everyone kind of into our neurotypical mold or neurotypical world is often harmful and costs or causes like long, long-term effects for some of those like, you know, individuals for sure. 
So back to my triggers. So another one, of course, is like feelings of like confusion or incompetence. So if a child is like feeling confused or they've not done a good job, or if they're feeling kind of like hard on themselves, um, that can kind of set off a trigger. Um, as well as kind of like exhaustion or overstimulation. So, or sorry, understimulation. So I kind of think of that one as like our base needs. So like tired, hungry, um, like, you know, need for like nurturing, those are kind of like our foundational needs that like every child has. So if even those needs are not being met, like we know that that can absolutely um, set off some of these non-functional behaviors. So we always want to try and ensure that there's those foundation needs being met, which can sometimes be tricky kind of in a, a preschool or school environment because some things may be happening at home, but that's where that connection piece really comes in and where we want to kind of you know, meet with the family, support them, see what they're doing at the home, see what they're noticing, see how we can maybe collaborate together to ensure that that child or has the tools that they need. So I'm going to just throw out another question. Are there any other triggers that you all have noticed maybe that can set off behaviors or anything kind of in your own experience? Okay, it's okay if you don't, that's all right. I can kind of keep going, but if anything comes to mind, please jump on in. So in terms of all these different things, we really wanna consider the child's individual needs when it comes to mitigating behaviors and supporting them where they're at. And these are often things that are kind of below the surface that we maybe wanna know and ensure that we're having supports or addressing while we're supporting this child with their behavior. So, oh, so Valerie's saying like a sibling or another person speaking, guessing for them. Yes, absolutely, Valerie. That can hugely be a trigger, right? Particularly if a child is communicating non-verbally, but then someone is speaking for them. It's like, well, I, that, I was delivering that message and you're kind of speaking for me. So that's really why we wanna honor and acknowledge all the, that, those forms of communication. So if a child is kind of like reaching, pointing to the fridge, and someone says like, or their big brother, big sister is like, oh, they want a snack. And then they have like a bit of, you know, maybe a meltdown or get upset. And it's like, well, yeah, they were telling me that they were pointing at the fridge and they were reaching. And so then we want to validate that and be like, yeah, you were telling me that you want a snack. So here we go. We want to always kind of as much as possible promote that independence on autonomy for communication. Because we know as adults, like we don't really like people speaking for us or kind of jumping in for us. So like, absolutely, that can be triggering. Thanks so much, Valerie. So these are, again, back to kind of this slide, these things underneath the surface. So things that we want to be aware of and ensure that we're supporting. So we want to be thinking, you know, in my own lens, thinking of things like reading difficulties, like in a school environment, if there's so much text and especially for like older school age learners and they have difficulty with reading, like we know that that could be a trigger or cause some, you know, one of those non-functional behaviors for that learner. Language delays, of course, right? If they're not understanding like classroom direction or what's being expected of them, or they're, you know, having difficulties communicating with peers can hugely be triggering. Speech disorders. So if a child is not well understood or people are kind of constantly misunderstanding them, um, that could be very, very triggering. We also wanna be aware and really come from a trauma-informed lens. So understanding like what maybe has happened in this child life previously or actively happening that is kind of shaping maybe their lens. Because oftentimes it's easy for us to kind of think of like, well, like that's not a big deal. Like, you know, it's just, you know, it's a cup color. Like, you know, maybe there's someone's really having upset about like the pink cup and we're like, is it really that big of a deal? But, but we don't kind of know maybe what has happened leading up to that, right? Like what has maybe been taken out of their bucket so far that day. And then this might be the one thing that that kind of pushes over the edge or maybe that feeling of like connection or being heard is really important to that child and when they feel like they're not being heard that can be incredibly triggering and from our lens you know we maybe haven't had that trauma or their shared experience we may not understand that but how i'm describing that that sounds a little bit like judgment right and that's where we don't want to be we don't want to be judging that behavior because we don't know what lens or what's been going on for that child, even that adult, right? Absolutely. I have this conversation with my husband all the time. We have two little girls, one's five, one's two. 
And, you know, there's always the day to day upset about a cup color or someone touching someone or something that's perceived as a small thing. And as like the grown up, you know, my husband's often like, and I, I am too, gosh, I am by no means exempt from this, but we think like, oh, like, you know, what's the big deal? Like, you know, your sister's just trying to do this or, you know, just that, but from where they're coming from, maybe it's been a long day at school. They've been maxing out on strategies. They're feeling tired. Some of their needs are unmet. Maybe they're feeling overstimulated. And then this one thing happens like invading their space or not, you know, getting a need met, not getting what they want. And that can hugely result um, in a behavior. So thinking from that trauma lens or is very important as well, like with like neurodivergency. So like autism or ADHD. So thinking that this child or individual's brain may be looking at this differently than how I am looking at it, or they may be interpreting the situation or what's going on differently. And I can try and be aware of that. So having awareness of what's going on is huge. So what are some of the warning signs and tells? So sometimes you can feel like, you know, I, I don't know when this behavior just kind of seemed to like come out of nowhere. And not to say that that's not true, because sometimes, yes, like things can just totally come out of nowhere. But some things that we can kind of look for when we kind of, if we're able to like play the tape back a little bit in our head or have like, you know, a good discussion about it, maybe they're starting to be like reduced focus. So a child was like really engaged in the activity and then all of a sudden they're kind of starting to look away or they're starting to fidget more. Um, and that's their body telling us like, I'm maxed on sitting or I'm maxed out on this activity. And by like pushing through, if this is challenging for me, we may result in, you know, a non-functional behavior. Like I may start to noodle or I may escape and just bolt or, you know, I may throw my stuff or I may start getting silly, right? Like that's kind of some of our precursors. If we see like a sudden change in their behavior. So if a child who's been kind of feeling, you know, in that green zone, kind of feeling happy and been, you know, enjoying the activity. And then all of a sudden is kind of like more withdrawn and not responding as much or something kind of changes. Um, that's a big warning sign. Uh, again, that restlessness. So when we start seeing like body starting to move, maybe some like nudging, we're kind of like getting in with our friends, um, increased voice volume. So if we see that a child is all of a sudden like really elevating their voice, decreased participation. So if they're starting again, not to kind of be engaging in something that they were or speaking really fast, we might start to see some of that like the beginning tells of like anxiety or nervousness, or I kind of think of it like we're starting to crest that wave, like we're going up kind of the behavior roller coaster a bit, like our body's starting to get a little bit elevated. So as always, we wanna to respond to students, not the behavior. So behavior, it's most often not personal. Sometimes it can feel that way because we kind of come in with our own lens, you know, just as the child may or person may come in with kind of what's been going on in, you know, their previous life experiences, but we also do too. And so there might be things that like feel personal to us. You know, I always joke that I'm like a recovering people pleaser. And so sometimes, you know, when like, I feel like my kids kind of know that. And when they'll say like, you know, like, I don't like you, or I'm like, oh, why? Like I'm trying so hard to, you know, meet your needs. And so that's something that it comes from me though, but I have to remember, like, it's, it's not about, it's not personal. It's not about me. Like she's trying to communicate something to me. That's not about me. She's trying to communicate that she's unhappy that, um, you know, I've turned off Paw Patrol or something, right. Because she was enjoying that. So that's her way of telling me that. Um, so again, we want to consider those life experiences that the student brings to the classroom. And we really want to acknowledge and validate their feelings and always assist with co-regulation. So we want to respond to that student. That's often like a kind of a hot button that people will say, because if we respond with kind of like empathy and validation, I've often kind of got people asking like, well, aren't we just then kind of, um, what's the word? Like allowing the behavior, like we're saying that's okay. Like if so, say if a child like, hits another child or hits you and we're trying to respond to the student and it's like, well, but they just hit you. Like, shouldn't there be like a punishment for hitting? Like that's, you know, we don't hit. And I always say, of course, of course we don't hit. Of course it is not okay to use your hands or put your hands on anybody. But in that moment, I need to address that in student or child's needs before I can address the behavior. So I need to kind of help meet their need, help them 
either crest that wave or co-regulate or come back to a teachable moment. And then we can discuss how there are better ways to, you know, deal with that feeling or, you know, communicate that feeling and know that hands are not for hitting. So yes, we're absolutely not okaying any of those kind of particularly like if they're going to be harmful to themselves or to other people, we know that that's not okay. Um, so that is something that is part of it being addressed. But we want to again come with responding to the student and curiosity as opposed to kind of like judgment or punishment. Because studies have shown just kind of time and time again, like a punishment model so doesn't really teach the child anything. It doesn't really teach them the skill with how to deal with that behavior when it comes back up, right? It can often then transition into like another behavior. So we want to respond to that and then use that teachable moment either post this interaction or if like you see that trigger kind of coming up again. So if we know that when that's happening, like you're kind of go-to, like I know my little two-year-old, her go-to is hitting. So if she has to share something, she's pretty quick with the on her sister or on us. And so if I know that's coming, I want to try and do some coaching. So I want to give her some time, let her know that her time is coming, let her know that we're going to be sharing that and that she has a short time left with that and helping kind of pre-teach some of those skills and validating. Yeah, I know that, you know, sharing sometimes is kind of crummy and, you know, you don't want to kind of let go of your toy, but we're going to do that for now because it's also your sister's toy. And then these are all the other things that are available to us. So doing kind of all that pre-teaching around something that I know will kind of result in that behavior moment. I hope this is all making sense. Please like jump on in if I've gone too quickly or um, if something is not... Um, kind of making sense. So again, here are kind of the four big, I kind of alluded to earlier with my little spoiler alert. Generally, any behavior can be boiled down to these four root causes. So I kind of think of it as like escape or avoidance, um, like attention or connection, getting what they want. So gaining something or like a sensory need. So like kind of, we need to change that level of stimulation. So generally it's one of these four things. So escape or avoidance, they may, they just want, it's just that. They want to avoid that task, situation, demand, if it's difficult or uncomfortable or non-preferred. So it can be quiet, like a noodle or a head down or like a covering of the ears or eyes. Um, it can be like a bolting. So I'm just like actually going to escape and avoid the classroom or, you know, go outside the door. For attention. So this is often those students who really like that need is like attention and connection. And so that may be things like whining. It may be things like tugging. Um, it may be things like positive behaviors as well. So like working hard or doing all, you know, kind of that little bit of that people pleasing I was alluding to in myself, like where they're really trying to, again, do that, that behavior to kind of get that attention or connection or approval. Um, can also be like interruptive. So like speaking out in class or like answering all their other students, right? Because they're doing that to kind of, they want that connection or attention. And so we want to try and see how can I pre-fill that? How can we help meet that child's need for attention and connection? And then further thinking of why, why do they have that need? What's maybe happening kind of in their background where they're needing or like in their day that they're needing to benefit from that? And how can we meet that need? Number three, can, there. I, can I prop the last question? Yes. Um, what about behaviors that are pushing boundaries? I don't, I don't see how it fits one of those four. For example, I have a kid that just wants to eat cat food. And you're like, well, no, you're not allowed to cat food. The cat food's not like for you. Um, but they will go there. They will look you in the eye and they'll do that. Like, is that attention? Well, well what is that and how do you deal with it? Yeah, you know, I would have to know more, but my, it could be a few things could be just getting what they want, like they may want that like maybe the cat food tastes salty, or they, they enjoy the taste of that. I mean, I'm not sure. So it may be that they want to do that. And we're putting a boundary in that they can't do that. And then they're going to push against that. Um, or yeah, it could also be that like attention or connection. So perhaps they know that by doing this behavior that they've been told is like a no or there's a boundary, they're going to get a response or an attention. Kids oftentimes too will know and engage in these kind of so-called negative behaviors because they know that it gets a response and it's a predictable response, which can be comfortable. 
sometimes like more positive behaviors or kind of new behaviors. It's like, I'm not totally sure like how you're going to respond, or it might not get the same level of response or the same consistent response. But I know if I go to that cat food and I start doing that, and I've been told, no, someone's going to be like pretty quick to come attend to me or jump in or provide like a response. So I would think it could be that and also that response so that by pushing that boundary and then the response that comes with it could also be like a sensory need. So it could be that someone is coming, coming engaging with them in this kind of predictable back and forth about pushing a boundary that might rev their engine. So it could be like one of those three things I would kind of postulate and maybe like some more detective work. What are your thoughts? Sorry, um, I think she goes over there and looks you in the eye. And it's kind of like, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried because it's a young girl and they're only going to get worse, right? And if it's something that is just a boundary that you've put in place, because I don't often tell her no, she's a really, really good kid. Mm -hmm. um, but that's like the one thing that she's saying no. I don't think it's attention because I'm sitting there playing with her where she looks me in the eye and walks over to the cat food. Um, but yeah, I guess you're probably right you probably have to sit and think about it a lot more but it's just something that I've noticed of like she's a good kid it's like one of the things that she does but it's starting to push a boundary she knows you don't eat the cat food you don't go near the cat food so sometimes she'll just look you in the eye and go straight over there and it may be something too in terms of that kind of we maybe file it under attention but that like testing of this new routine so this might be like a new thing that is happening and it's like oh okay so I'm like gonna kind of push this and test this like what happens if I kind of keep doing that like this might be a new thing and kind of that may also be kind of filling a little bit of that kind of stimulation need so it's like maybe something kind of a bit different or exciting or they're kind of waiting for the response or they're kind of learning what that response may be and it's a kind of maybe even a different form of attention like even maybe playing with her and in our brain we might be thinking like again that's from our lens, we're thinking like, I just was giving you attention, right? We're playing together, we're reading, but yet you're kind of going here and, you know, pushing this boundary about the cat food, but that may be filling kind of like a different attention bucket. So it might feel different from her, for her, than maybe how we're viewing it. If that makes sense. Yeah, great. Thanks. I'll look, I'll think about it. <laughs> yeah. And that's like, kind of, I think the first thing it sounds like you've got some awesome ideas and you're already really doing some great observations about that. So I think, yeah, trying to do that. And I think what I would suggest in terms of a strategy, I mean, I think you can always do the whole kind of like, you can accommodate the environment, like you could move the cat food if it's possible. Right. So we could kind of like eliminate that situation. Um, but what we could also do is maybe then when she goes to the cat food, maybe instead of kind of using that word no, which can some kids can kind of then push up against, we can say, so you know, cat food is not for us to eat. That's for fluffy. Here are some things we can eat. If you're hungry, you can have, we have some salty crackers, we have some pretzels, we have some of this and that. This is what's available. So could we go do that together? So see if we can kind of try and get ahead of it and maybe instead of saying, no, don't do that. It's like, this is not an option or a choice, but this is what's available. And maybe providing that like reasoning. I'm not sure how old this child is, but. Does that sound? Yeah, my pleasure. So this last one, again, I've kind of talked about a lot is those sensory needs. So when we know things are overstimulating, understimulating, and you may have also heard terms like sensory seekers um, or sensory avoiders. Um, they will do these behaviors to try and meet those sensory needs. So um, a sensory seeker may like underreact to sensory input and need more of it to function. So they need something to rev their engine. A sensory avoider may like overreact to sensory input. So they wanna avoid that. Like their engine is already very, very revved and this is gonna like push us over the edge. So these kids, you know, they may be like overwhelmed or hyperactive. And it's really important that we try and meet these different kinds of sensory needs in a more appropriate way to kind of avoid being over or understimulated. We kind of want to aim for that, you know, Goldilocks just right kind of range. So some examples of accommodations like in a classroom or a home may look like visual schedules and supports, um, extra time for processing for tasks, 
uh, breaks before or after challenging tasks. So allowing some of that time for like movement or a brain break or something to help us feel like more regulated or ready to kind of challenge a or tackle a difficult task. Um, previewing any changes to a schedule. So again, we want to be as predictable and as transparent as possible. Um, we may want to like reduce demands and have like flexible timing. So if we know this is going to be tricky, we may say like, you know, it may be it's we were aiming to have this done by here but like we have lots of time to do it if it's not done until the end of the day or till tomorrow um that's fine right so we may want to like reduce some of those demands and we may want to reduce sensory input like in learning spaces so like christine was saying so like kind of minimize our walls try and reduce classroom noise um maybe look at like your physical space in terms of how much like you know i don't love this word but like clutter things that are kind of in the space that may be stimulating to some kids and some adults for sure uh we also want to put in like some time ahead of time to do like pre-teaching of like vocabulary and expectations and letting kids know about some of these important concepts before we're in the thick of it like in an activity or something's happening um, we may want to ensure that we, we are approaching like communication accessibility. So just like there are kind of, you know, ramps for wheelchair users, we want to ensure that we have like accessible options to some of our like learners or students who have language difficulties. So we may want to have some like visuals present or some core boards or teach like a sign or let them know it's okay to point or offer like tangible choices so that they can just kind of let you know in that moment. So having those nonverbal non -verbal communication options is super important. And then as much as possible, we want to have space for regulation and co-regulation. So if a learner is not able to like regulate right in this part in the classroom, maybe there is like another cozy corner or a quiet corner or an area away that is maybe promotes more regulation or co-regulation. So I'm just cognizant of time. So I'm going to keep going. So I was hoping we can maybe get to one or two of these case studies. And if we don't get to any of them, like Christine, you let me know when, when I'm all done here and they'll all be on the slide as well. And then I have kind of like the, the answers or the thoughts afterwards. So there, it should still be like kind of available to you. So here is case study number one. So this is Dana. So Dana is a grade five student. Uh, she's usually cooperative in the classroom and is well liked by her peers. Um, she's getting she's reading at grade level uh, she's slow to get ready for recess and always asks for help to open her lunch containers uh, dana will become visual visually upset during pencil and paper tasks and it will often lead to like meltdown screaming and aggression when prompted to complete the classroom task she will attempt to leave the classroom during pencil and paper tasks so what are you guys thoughts any thoughts about dana here and what's going on no wrong answers. This is our group think tank. So any thoughts are welcome. So my first thought would be looking at, so what are some of the things happening, of course, before Dana is having some of her like bigger behaviors, so her meltdowns or her screamings. So I noticed there's kind of a connection here with like paper and pencil tasks getting dressed, opening lunch containers that kind of lead me to wonder if perhaps Dana has like difficulties with fine motor tasks or maybe has difficulty with like hand strength or things like that that are causing her to become upset. And that comes from, again, that area of that ability of the task maybe above her ability currently, and that leads to frustration. So let's look here. So again, so we're thinking fine motor delays are impacting her participation. Her behavior is telling us that she's having difficulty with this task and she needs accommodation or support to help reduce the demands or even like some alternative forms for written expression or writing. Like perhaps she'd do better with like a keyboard uh, or doing her tasks like that way as opposed to doing it like pencil and paper. An OT referral might be really helpful for Dana to help address like any motor delays and help support her like participation in the classroom. Um, she also may benefit from engaging in like calming activities before writing. So we may want to build in some kind of calming activities. So either regulation independently, like self-regulation um, or co-regulation before tackling this difficult task to help reduce some of these more, um, you know, non-functional behaviors. 
So any questions about Dana? Or I'll, oh, we got some in the chat. Oh, Valerie's a little confidence in her ability to use pencil, paper, and motor skills. You got it. That's exactly right. I have a question because a, sure. a lot of these examples to, um, I guess, not have the behavior happen is let's give them something different. So in Dana's example, she doesn't want to draw with a pen and paper. You're saying maybe give her a keyboard and that kind of thing. Um, how do we, because at some point, they've got to learn to use a pen and paper. They're not going to go their whole life without a pen and paper. So how do we kind of ease them into these activities that perhaps trigger these behaviors? Absolutely. So that's kind of where that OT referral would come in, where we want to work on this in a more supportive environment. So in that kind of more structured, supportive environment, she can work on that task as opposed to kind of the demand of doing it in the classroom on a time frame with perhaps like less support. So if we can in those moments, sorry everyone, and Fright, Fright has joined us. So Fright is my amazing colleague who um, is fantastic and has joined us at the end of their session. So that's great. So I would say that Valerie, I would say like, yes, we know that pencil and paper tasks are important. And of course we kind of don't want to think that, you know, Dana is going to avoid pencil and paper tasks for her whole life. And I'll also then say too, like time is a big help in a lot of these situations. Like we know that a lot of these skills will kind of continue to develop like with time and practice. And if perhaps if she has a more um, like set up environment, she may feel calmer and more willing to like engage with these tasks will help further develop that skill. So I didn't mean kind of to say that, you know, we're not them pencil and paper tasks we don't have to do. But in that moment, like how can we accommodate to help her feel successful? And ultimately our goal in the class is probably like that written, that assignment. So it's completing like this assignment of sharing what she knows about whatever they're doing in their grade five class. And then providing that supported environment with like an OT or with like teacher providing some support that maybe would meet her where her at to continue to develop that skill. Does that answer your question? Yep, sounds good. Okay, thank you. So I'll go on to the next one here. So case study number two, so this is Amani. So Amani is a grade three student. Uh, she is usually very quiet and cooperative in the classroom, but Amani has difficulties initiating play with other children and is often seen playing alone at recess. Uh, during class, Amani picks at her skin and her clothing. Amani cries and becomes overwhelmed easily, especially during like group work or gym. Um, she's sent home often with like an upset stomach. And when asked what she needs, Amani often says, I don't know. So what do we think about Amani? And Amani, I know we have kind of as a grade three student, but Amani could very easily be like in a daycare or a preschool um, or an early learning um, setting, like in demonstrating some of these behaviors or observations. So does anything stick out about Amani? What your thoughts are? Confidence issues, maybe. Yeah, maybe confidence. So I would kind of think maybe a little bit of anxiety. So maybe I would maybe connect Amani's kind of upset stomach and maybe some of her like picking of her skin and her clothing is a way that she's kind of trying to communicate. Like maybe with the picking, it might be something she's doing to regulate. And by telling us about her upset stomach, she's maybe trying to communicate to us that like she's anxious or something is bothering her. So yeah, I, I would agree. Um, Val, so you've seen this with trauma. Absolutely. So this is something we can very much see with children who have experienced trauma or are currently um, undergoing like trauma. Absolutely. Another thing I might notice here with Amani, I'll just go here ahead to our little write up, uh, is like sensory, sensory processing challenges that are affecting her participation. So difficulty like in um, those loud glass like group work or the gym environment and she's having trouble at recess and she's you know often a quiet learner so maybe she's feeling very overwhelmed by the noise or feeling very overstimulated in these environments um, she may also have like needs like some slp for some social communication support like sounds like she's having trouble like initiating play or connecting with peers and could benefit from some support with that also, when she's kind of asked to kind of discuss her feelings or identify, she's saying, I don't know. So that may lead us to think perhaps if she doesn't maybe have the words or she's not able to kind of communicate that verbally. So it could benefit from some language support from an SLP. Yeah. Did you want to add anything about this one, Frey? Just because you top on in or? 
Should I head on to the next one? I even wanted to say that um, even we can see teens with this. Yes. So in, in incidences when um, maybe students do have a language delay, they, we, they might fly under the radar for a really long time because they're cooperative in the classroom. They don't have any of those behaviors that stand out as like, oh, they need an assessment. So at this point, this child could have gotten quite far and not have been picked up as having um, any kind of speech or language delays that merited us uh, seeing an SLP or an OT. But um, that's something to watch for is that if kids are just having a really hard time, they might say, I don't know. They might say like, I don't care. I'm not interested. I'm fine. And so they're really just using those scripts. So a script is just a block of speech we learn in a chunk and we use it in a certain context where we know it's appropriate. So a child might learn that I don't know gets rid of the adult <laughs> or gets rid of the problem. And so this child could just be relying on those scripts. Absolutely. So do we, do you think, Christine, do we have time for one more? Because we are at the end of our time. I'm just going to say let's go for one more. I think people like these case studies. Okay, yeah, let's do one more. So uh, this is Jordan. So Jordan's a grade two student. Uh, he has a hard time remaining seated in the classroom and is often seen wandering around or trying to leave the class. Um, he's easily distractible and is often seen trying to engage with others in conversation or play during class time. Um, with redirection, he'll sit for a few minutes, but then attempts to wander or leave the class again. Um, he'll try to escape to like a sensory room or the gym where he'll try and like jump on the trampoline, climb the rock wall, use the slide. Um, he can become aggressive when attempting to transition him like out from the gym or the sensory room and will often say things like, I hate the class. So what do we think about Jordan? And I feel like I have seen a few Jordans in my time where we often think of those. Oh, I don't want to give it away. Look at me. I'm just rambling. Any thoughts about Jordan? Under or overstimulated. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, yeah, Jordan, I think has an unmet need. Un, did that sound, that sounded funny. Unmet need for movement. And he is trying to do that in any way that he can in like the confines of his classroom. Um, but sometimes that's, that's not meeting the need for sure. So he, for movement-based activities and breaks during class time. So it would be, Sorry, I just see the chat. I just wanted to. Oh, often labeled ADHD. There may be, right? There may be some neurodivergency or he may be a neurodivergent learner that would benefit from some further assessment or support in that way. So he would also probably benefit from like a visual schedule using like first and then to help him know like what's coming and to help maybe build in some of those movement breaks. So again, we want to try and maybe meet Jordan's need ahead of the time before we're in maybe some of those less functional or maladaptive strategies of Jordan, leaving the classroom or escaping or like disrupting other learners. Um, he might also benefit from like some structured use like in that outside time or in the gym time and wanting us to maybe check in like, how is he doing on these different activities? So what, like which one do we see is maybe getting, doing the most for Jordan. So, you know, the rock wall we're thinking is often like heavy work because you're using like your own body's weight and movement to kind of help regulate yourself. And so by like moving your own muscles against your own body on the wall, that's often considered heavy work. Um, like jumping on the trampoline can often be thought as like deep pressure to the joints because as like you're bouncing, you're getting a lot of really good feedback, like in like your ankles and your legs and that travels all the way up your body. Uh, the slide, maybe like vestibular. So maybe that kind of sliding motion going up and down. So which kind of of these movements are we think would be most helpful for Jordan? Um, he may benefit to see like how long, like kind of doing some check-ins. So like, where is Jordan's like max with like classroom activities and how could we maybe build in some of this stuff ahead of time before he's perhaps becoming disruptive. And that's maybe when like our scheduler, a visual timer may help Jordan as well. Like, so seeing something more tangible that he, can kind of see that what he needs to do or how much time he has left for an activity before he knows he can, we can engage in some movement or do something different. Um, we also really want to kind of determine his interests and try and incorporate them in the classroom. So maybe Jordan needs a bit of support with like engagement with the material. So maybe too, he's often like kind of avoiding it and not into it because it's not really interesting to him or he's kind of, and also another thought, I'm not sure if it's written there, 
Um, we have to maybe look at the task ability too. Like maybe those tasks are tough for Jordan. So it's very easy for him to kind of avoid that. So we want to see if there's a way that we could accommodate that task or address like any difficulties that he's having perhaps with those kind of sit down classroom activities aside from just the actual sitting portion of it. Because sometimes too, even if the task is difficult, we may, it may then look like that kind of need for movement and escape, but it could also be to do with the task. Sorry, Frank, do you want to add about this one? Yeah, a few things came up the last time we presented this. So the first one was, yes, someone pointed out that it could be that the, the task is above Jordan's ability level um, or just like the way that it is set up. So sometimes kids who have difficulties with executive functioning um, may start um, struggle a lot with task initiation. So starting it and then also perseverance through a task. So finishing it. Um, another thing that came up is that not all movement is built the same uh, or made equal. So some kids, you know, you might build yoga into your daily classroom routine. You might build, you know, doing jumping jacks near your desk or like a race, but that might not be the level of cardio, like true, like full body muscle movement, like exhaustion that a child needs to get that stimulation level. Um, so that's when an OT would come in to assess kind of what would be a good amount of movement and what exercises could be built into the classroom schedule. And then the last thing came in is, yes, I like the comment that was made about ADHD, because that is exactly what someone said last week. They said, this child has ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to point out that it's interesting, but ADHD presents very differently uh, in every person. And so the kind of the stereotype is like a boy who's antsy and can't stop moving and who maybe is disruptive during class. Um, typically this is seen more in um, children assigned male at birth. And then the presentation for ADHD for children who are assigned female at birth um, is quite different. And so ADHD can look a lot of different ways. And it's also fair to say that this isn't necessarily indicative that this child has ADHD. ADHD is like typically included with other uh, symptomology, but it is, yeah, very often labeled ADHD, you're right. And so some people go, oh, that child's just ADHD, like they need an ADHD assessment. Um, and yeah, that is like the, the go-to assumption that this is ADHD. So I'm glad that you pointed that out. Yeah, and Valerie just added, that's why she kind of added labeled, um, yeah. often like not certain, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So what are your thoughts, Christine? Should, should we, how many, do we have one more or is there two more? I think, let's see. Maybe, is there only one or two more? Let's see, jump ahead here. There's oh, only one there's more. There's just one more. Okay, I'll go very fast. So this is Ricky, he's a grade six student. He struggles significantly with participating appropriately at school. He's disruptive in class, talking out of turn, staying off topic, joking around, doesn't follow the class rules. Um, at times, Ricky becomes aggressive with staff and other students. Um, he can be defensive or use language that's inappropriate for school. Um, during recess, Ricky plays a lot of like hands-on physical games and struggles with role-playing games. Um, Ricky's grades are poor, especially for written assignments. So in the interest of time, I'll just kind of jump ahead here. So I think one of the big first things is that Ricky's behavior is telling us that he's struggling with receptive and expressive language. Um, particularly probably with perhaps like his reading comprehension, his written expression. Um, there may also be like a motor component in terms of written expression that we would want to look at. I would also really look to kind of um, sensory needs for Ricky because it seems like with a lot of that kind of like hands-on physical rough play, he's kind of choosing to engage with at recess that perhaps he has kind of like an unmet sensory need in his body that he's trying to get by like engaging in that kind of play. Um, he may also kind of struggle with in terms of like social communication. So in terms of like appropriateness or his audience or maybe like how to communicate what he's feeling in like an appropriate way. But that also may be then related to that language delay, maybe not having those words um, to communicate what he's feeling. So like Sprite was saying that um, he's using scripts, right? Like, you know, he may know or have heard these scripts and it's a lot easier to tell someone, you know, kind of an expletive or something like that that they know versus kind of talking more about their feelings. And they know that script often results in that kind of predictable result of like ending whatever's happening and that person having that kind of predictable result. Um, what did you wanna add, right, about Ricky here? Yeah, so if Ricky has receptive language delays, he might not be following what's happening in class, yeah. which if you are in an environment where everyone 
it feels like they're talking a different language than you. Uh, it, it can be very easy to become confused and frustrated and even angry in those situations. Um, and that is also evidenced by his lack of playing role play, role play yes. games. So as we um, use more and more of our um, language-based play skills, our play becomes more person-focused and less object-focused, and it becomes more language-heavy. And so if a child has um, expressive or receptive language delays, they might not be able to follow the play of their peers and so they might result in playing like lots of those hands-on more physical games mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. so i think that is the end thank you so much sorry again for going a little bit over time there please let me know if there's like any questions or in fright let us know if there's any questions or anything that you have here if there's anything else we can share about I think the last extra 10 minutes is well worth it. Okay, yes, thank you. <laughs> it's I'm important so sorry. to have yeah. um, these case studies. And I think that's practical things that people always look for anyways. Mm -hmm. So yeah, is there any questions from our people? There's a few of you. No, I don't see any questions. There's no nothing in the chat. So thank you for the big takeaway behaviors always associated with negative. Yes. Yeah. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Okay. I'm and if you do think of any questions, feel free to email those to us and we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. I'll put our emails here in the chat. So just if you wanted to see, they're very much the same, just our first name at speech. Yeah. SLP.com. But okay. I'll stop the recording now.